and, and God certainly does send his love and his faithfulness, and you heard the testimonies of Mike's children. Uh, I just want to give a, another shout out to his wife, man. She's nothing to play with. Let's give her a hand. <laughs> I value and appreciate strong women um, that, that know how to do it in the order of God and aren't in a hurry. Um, it drives some of us men crazy, but I do value that and I do appreciate that. Um, oh, last week we started talking, um, for the first seven weeks of the year, um, we've been talking about that God had given me the fact that this is the year of better. And, and, and so many of us want to become better. So many of us want to do better. And, and, and so many people have told people that have suffered with addiction that you're better than this. And because of the shame and the guilt that we carry, um, we, we don't really realize that they're loving on us and they see the potential in us that we are better than this. And, and, but it's one thing, I mean, it's kind of like t it's telling a person, hey, God's got it, don't worry about it. But how does God have it? I mean, how can I get to the steps to teach me how to give it to God, how to keep it to, with God, and how to learn from God in the process because it's not a sprint, it's a marathon. Um, so it was on my heart um, as I grieved on Sunday evening a couple weeks ago, coming off the seven-week study on the Better Series is, how do you really become better? How is it that you um, can be the best person that God has called you to be? I always said that better is perfect. If you give God your best, like you gave your addiction your best, you, you will ultimately become a better person. Um, so God put it on my heart to really talk about um, Moses and Joshua as they, they were charged by God himself to lead um, the people in captivity, the slaves, out of the promised land, out of Egypt, into the promised land, out of Egypt. And last week I talked to you about the, the conversation that God had with Moses, the burning bush, and where God had said, take off your sandals, you're standing on holy ground, and Moses hid his face, and, and God had charged Moses, um, you need somebody to lead you. We all need leaders in our lives. To, to lead um, the Israelites out of Egypt into their promised land. And, and we talked more or less about that in, in the oppressed people, the, the people that were in captivity. Um, and Moses, you know, kind of said, who me? Um, and, and really, that's an authentic leader, somebody that doesn't think they're all that in a bag of chips. And they got to rely on God at a high level because within their own self, within their own strength, they're not equipped, but God promises us, if we're servants, that he will thoroughly equip us for every good work. And we, we began to study the journey of the Israelites and how it is um, that, 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 that they forgot about what God had already done. They forgot that God had brought them out of Egypt, and they began um, becoming murmurers and complainers. And I got pretty direct with you last week. If you're above ground and out of prison, you ain't got no pipe syringe, you're not in the casino, you ain't got, you ain't got no bottle in your mouth, you shouldn't be complaining, you should be praising God. I mean, I don't know if you came from where I came from. I mean... I mean, so, so, so that's what, what they ended up doing. Um, they became murmurers, and, and murmurers will all eventually turn into unbelievers. Um, if you complain enough, you're going you're, you're gonna to lose your belief system. And we talked about that, but before that was the parting of the Red Sea. And, and oftentimes, um, we forget about what God has already done. And, 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 and then they forgot about that they got taken out of Egypt. And then God parted the Red Sea through Moses. And then they soon forgot about that. And then God provided them manna. And then towards the end of Moses' life, Moses had sent a couple spies over to the promised land. And every week for 15 years, I've stood in front of you and told you that this is what God has for you. But God will not typically do it for you. He'll do it with you. And if we were just to listen to him and listen to the people, the Moseses that have gone before us, God always answers a problem with a person. There is no spiritual renegades. Read your Bible. There's authority. There's order. And you've got to follow it. That's hard for people like us because we have rebelled against authority. And, and we went up over that last week and we talked about how Moses had died and, and Joshua was up under Moses and he was of the DNA of Moses and he was like a little Moses, but he wasn't Moses. He had a different personality of Moses. So God had charged, charged Joshua to be strong and courageous. And, and the people saw that Joshua was strong and courageous. So in turn, they became strong and courageous. Don't ever follow a leader that isn't courageous. 
Don't ever follow some person that doesn't know where to activate and get strength, which is from God. Don't follow a wishy-washy person. Follow a person that's got vision. And if you attach yourself to that global vision, your own personal visions will come to pass. I'll give you hundreds of testimonies. But what blessed me last week was in my small group. Um, it's one thing to be a pastor and teach. It's another thing to see the word of God, which is living and active in Hebrews 4.12, to come um, fruition in someone's life. I loved it how Mike broke down um, those, those things um, that I taught last week of, of the Red Sea and the manna. So I just want to bring him back up here real quick and let him personalize. Um, you know, I don't want to overly spiritualize anything that you can't apply practically. So I just wanted Mike to real quickly share um, what the Red Sea was for him and, and what, what the manna looked like for him. <clears throat> Hello, can you hear me? Okay, um, real quick. Uh, so the first was that, um, you know, I cried out to God. I was enslaved to my addiction, right? I was oppressed by my addiction. So I cried out to God, God saved me. He sent me to rehab, so now I'm free from rehab, and uh, or I'm I'm sober after coming to rehab, and I start to walk out of rehab, and I'm like, okay, well, wait a minute, um, what lies ahead of me is too big. It seems like a un, a giant, like I don't know what to do. It's too big of an obstacle, but th- behind me is my addiction and all the destruction. So I was stuck in the middle, and what happened was that. Um, God parted my Red Sea, right? And he parted the Red Sea, the same way he parted the Red Sea for Moses because Moses went to him and said, God, what do you want me to do? God gave him specific directions and he was obedient. The same way my pastor was obedient. He said, God, what do you want me to do? God told him, I need you to go make Serenity Village so that you can make a place for the slave addicted, uh, the, the addicted, the, the slaves that are addicted, right, to free them from captivity, to free them from their addiction. So he was obedient. The leader was obedient, opened up that sea. I walked over to the other side. Now we're in the, now we're in the wilderness, okay? So now I'm free. I don't have to worry about the addiction. I don't have to worry about this. I'm safe. I'm all good. But then very shortly thereafter, what happens is I start thinking, okay, well, I've been doing this program for a minute, but... I got to be there how many days a week? I got to do what? I agreed to it to get over to safety, but now I'm over in safety. I'm feeling kind of comfortable, and I'm like, well, wait a minute. I got to do what? And on top of all this, you want me to serve who? And I got to come on set? Wait a minute. And I started murmuring, or we started murmuring. Not me, Pastor. I didn't murmur. Uh, <laughs> we started murmuring. No, I started murmuring. And, um, and so you, you, you start murmuring, and then... That gets taken care of, and then you're walking a little farther, and you're like, okay, well, how long we got to walk this? I got to go to the fact. I got to do this. I got to do that. I could just go jump and do this, that, and the other thing and take it over myself. I have a better way. And um, so you get in the wilderness, and if you just follow the leader, he has the GPS. I don't even got MapQuest. (laughs) And I'm trying to bump around my own way, right? But instead of following GPS in the program, I, I started thinking to myself, well, if I just take a little bit of what he said here, and then I'm, but he doesn't really understand me, and I ain't got time to explain it, so I'm going to make my own program, and I'm going to customize the program, and I'm going to follow the pro, that, that program, and that's when you walk around for 40 years. That's when you walk around for 40 years. But if you want to get there, which only should have took him about two weeks, I know it seems like he's walking slow, but he's not. He's pacing you. He's pacing you. He knows if you start going too fast, you're going to stumble, right? So he's pacing you. Uh, So so that was it. And then um, the scouts. So then they get over there, and then everything's fine. They're almost there. They can see it, and he sends the scouts. He sends his people over there, and they go over there, and they say, yep, sure enough, it's the land of milk and honey. It's everything God promised you it was. You're going to make it. It's no big deal, right? Then you got the people, the doubters. Well, I'm lactose intolerant. I don't even drink milk. <laughs> and, uh, you know, honey, honey, honey makes my fingers sticky. <laughs> Saying why you can't do it, right? Why, why it shouldn't be there. 
But the promise, the promised land, the scouts that said it's all what it is, are all the people that stood up before. All of those people. That's more than 12 scouts. That's a whole bunch of scouts that are telling you if you just do the walk the program, not your program. Your program got you sitting in the seat, got me sitting in the seat. Well, a year ago, got me sitting in the seat. But the, the program, right, my own program, my best thinking, right, got me where I'm at. If you relinquish that, follow your Moses. He knows how to get you to the promised land. So I, I want to talk to you about this wilderness journey that all of us have been on on this map here. And, and really, um, basically, this is where they started, okay? Where the green dot is. And it could, they could have just went from here to here to get to the promised land. But they didn't. It was an 11-day trip. I think that's kind of funny. I've been through 11 treatments. It was an 11-day trip that took them 40 years. Now, for the life of me, which is my life story, because a lot of us will say, well, how can I relate to the Israelites? How can I relate to the Red Sea? I don't understand. This book never goes out of style. This book is always relevant. So I don't know how you can relate to it, but I can definitely relate to it. I don't know why I just didn't go from here to here. For some odd reason, they went this way. And they had miracle after miracle. Now, I don't know what this is, but I can relate. This is me at Teen Challenge in 2001. Go all the way out here and come back to Teen Challenge. If I would have just stayed at the very place and then I went back to the same treatment center. So the here is where we are today and they got to cross the Jordan. So when they're about ready to cross the Jordan, it doesn't matter how long it took as long as it takes. But it should start taking right now. You can't, you can't live another relapse through. You, you can't go another year in a journey. And it was an 11-day trip that should have taken them between 60 and 80, hour, 60 to 80 hours to walk at 3 miles an hour. It's about 220 to 260 miles, depending on who you're talking to. And, 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 and they could have just went right there, but they didn't. You could have just went right there and worked the program, followed the leader, and got a sponsor and worked the steps and got really real. But you didn't, nor did I. And it doesn't matter what happened up until this point. What matters is what's going to happen now. Yeah. Now, now, at the end of the day, the devil's crafty. He's going to tell you, once you finally do get close to your promises, he's going to tell you what took you so long. Well, who cares how it took you this long? As long as you keep moving. That's right. And it's not so much how far you got left, it's how far you've come from. Yeah. You may not be what you, um, where you should be, but thank God you're not what you used to be. It's spiritual progress versus spiritual perfection. Lord, do a quick work tonight. Thank you for another day above ground and out of prison. Thank you for breath in my lung, even though my voice is scratchy and it's sore. Lord, I thank that you do something quick tonight that'll open the eyes of your people. Lord, have your way. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. I'm going to be quick, um, but I'm here to tell you the title of this message is, is about crossing, cutting, and breaking down walls. Now, a lot of us aren't willing to do that in our recovery. Let me remind you, you were more than willing to do it in your addiction. You were more than willing to cross over to the other side that you said you would never go to. You were more than willing to cut back things out of life like family time, sleep, um, nutrition, food. You were willing to cut food out of your life for your heroin. You were willing to cut time, family time. You were willing to cut back. You were willing to cross over to a side that scared you in your addiction. And, and, and you began to build these walls um, of hedges of protection. So we know how to cross, cut, and, and, and break down walls. It didn't matter. So, so when you look at the text now in Joshua 2, um, basically Joshua, instead of sending 12, like Moses 12, he's spending, sending two spies over there. And he's sending two because I'm here to tell you, don't get around too many different perspectives. Don't, don't, don't let, oh, what do you think, mom? What do you think, dad? I mean, take into account these are the very people that dropped you off at our door. I love my parents. I told um, Pastor Terry that my, I'm the reason why I'm alive is, but I needed somebody that could understand me. 
I've been analyzed, psychologized, and all those different lies and, and, and stuff of that nature. So Joshua sent two spies now. And because it wasn't just that he wanted, and he said, especially Jericho, read your sheets. And there's a reason why he sent them to Jericho, not just that God said that they could, because these two people needed to be encouraged in Jericho. And of all people that they met in Jericho was a prostitute. Now, none of us should judge prostitutes. I used to do a lot of dope with a lot of prostitutes. Every one of us is a prostitute. You prostituted yourself out for acceptance. You prostituted yourself out for, for all these different things. So don't judge Rahab. God, God puts us in his word to tell us that God can use anyone. That's why he has Paul write the majority of the New Testament, the very person that killed Christians. So he eliminates the excuses. So these two spies, they go and meet Rahab, now the prostitute of all people. That's why quit looking for the scholars to lead you to the promised land. Look for the drug addicts, the ones that are walking. You know, and, 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 and at the end of the day, thank you for the 10 hand claps. I appreciate that. But, 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 but it tells us that you can be utilized by somebody that the world has thrown away. And Rahab lived in the city walls. So she was doing business as a prostitute in the city walls. And these two spies were sent, as Joshua said, especially Jericho. Because God had impressed it upon Rahab, who was now coming out of her lifestyle. And, 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 and Rahab was to remind the two spies of what God has already done in their life. Read your sheets. God said, Rahab said to these two men, hey, I heard about what the Lord did at the Red Sea. That was 40 years ago. The thing is that, why is it that everybody else but you have to remember what God did for you? So Rahab reminded them what God has done. And she said to them, because you know what? The last time he sent spies, they, they, like, like, like Mike just said, you know, yeah, it is the land of milk and honey. Yeah, the promises are there, but they started to be fearful. Now check out what happens here. Rahab tells them, hey, I mean, I know this is your city. So Rahab reminds them of what God has already done for them. And Rahab tells them, I live here and I know it's yours. They needed that reminder to go back to Joshua. And then Rahab goes on to say this. This is profound to me. Um, she now makes a deal. Hey, I, I took care of you. You, you, you got to take care of me. See, a lot of us are afraid to be taken care of. And a lot of us are afraid to care for. And, and it's all about reciprocity. It's all about reciprocity. Um, pastor, pastor knows that in the front row. She, she pushed him right into giving financially. You can't expect something for nothing. You have to understand it doesn't matter where you are for your, in your journey. So now Rahab's saying, hey, this is your city. I know what God has done. So it increased their confidence level for them to go report back. And then Rahab says, when you come and take your city, I want you to protect my family. Now the next thing on your sheets is when they cross the Jordan. Now the Jordan is a little different than the Red Sea. And the Jordan, if you read your sheets, um, they got the report back and, and they need to cross the Jordan to take Jericho. And basically what Joshua is saying to them at this point is, let's get up, let's go do this. And this is how Joshua sets it up. Joshua more or less sends the leaders first to carry the Ark of the Covenant. You always want to be following the leader. The Ark of the Covenant is the presence of God. When I taught you about David, they, see a lot of us want to go do things without the presence of God. A lot of us want to go, want, want to do godly things without the presence of God. So he says this to the, to the, to the priest. He says, hey, um, it's going to be different this time. You're getting close to your promise. The closer you get to your promises, the harder it becomes. And they're getting close to the promise. And, and Joshua says, I want the priest to carry the ark and I want the priest to walk in to things. So at the end of the day, the closer you get to what God has for you, the harder it's going to be. This time, I'm not going to split the sea. This time, you got to get your feet wet. So the priests go into the river and immediately um, <coughs> taking the first step. See, the, the first step is always the hardest step. The first step is we admitted we were powerless over our addiction and our lives had become unmanageable. That's a hard step. Once you take the first step into the thing that God has called you to cross, in this text it's the Jordan River, when the priest's foot hit the water because the priest's foot had to get wet, the river stopped. Here's how the river stopped. 
Once they had the presence of God crossing over what God told them to cross over, because whatever you're called to cross over right now, you're going to need the presence of God. What happened in this miracle, they were willing to listen to God. The stream was at an all-time high. It was harvest time, and the river was flowing, the current. See, when the current of life is flowing against you, you can't be afraid not to get your feet wet. You just have to do, thank you for the half a clap. You just have to do what God is calling you to do. I got my feet wet 15 years ago, and I crossed over into a land that I did not think was mine, but I kept on walking. God stopped the flow that was coming against them at all. The flow from the, from the upstream of the liver, river began to bubble. Everything on this side dried up. I asked God, what does that mean for me? God says, as soon as you were willing to cross over, I stopped everything from coming against you. You can still hear. You can, I, when, when the river is coming against you, I still hear the bubbling. I see the noise. I see the waves. It scares me. But there is no weapon that's formed against me that shall prosper. It doesn't mean I don't hear it. But what God did is this. When I looked at everything that has ever come against me, when I put my foot in the water, it dried up. And I said this on Sunday, God, what does that mean for me? God says, look around. It's all dry land and that's your ministry. So my fear dried up. My anxiety dried up. My hatred dried up. My pride dried up. My cocaine dried up. My alcohol dried up. And I said, God, why is it all dry? He says, that's where I'm going to send the people to walk to you that you're going to lead. Well, I can't relate to that. Well, that's because you haven't stepped in the river. So when, when he dries up, everyone crosses. What happens in this text is God says, I want the leaders to stay in the middle of the river. And I want to make sure everyone goes across. See, sometimes your leaders have to send you on before them to make sure that nobody gets left behind behind them. And when it was all crossed and it was all said and done, the river started flowing again. Why did God have the river flow again? Because you, once you cross the thing that God has called you to cross, you ain't going to know how to get back. Yeah. Because when you try to get back, you're going to have to swim through streams. When God dried it up for you to cross, so say, what do I need to cross? What do I need to cross? The next thing is, what do you need to cut? Now, now they get to a town called Gilgal. Gilgal is a very specific, important thing to really recognize as you study the Word of God. Where Gilgal is, it's really, you know, they didn't circumcise everybody when they left Egypt, but they did circumcise some. That's a cutting. Now, us males, we probably can't remember that when we were little, but basically what a natural circumcision is, is cutting off a part of your flesh that collects dirt. It's cutting off a part of your foreskin that collects dirt that is naturally going to get infected. Now, God is talking about literally a cutting with flint knives, but God is also saying, hey, you, I can't take you any farther unless you get cut. So many of us have been in Gilgal for too long and we're fri afraid to cut things out of our lives. God is saying, I've taken you this far on grace and mercy. I've given you manna. I've done all these things, but I'm tired of spoon feeding you, feeding you. You are close to your promise now, and you're going to have to cut. I'm not going to cut you. You got to cut it. So after you cross, you got to cut. You got to be circumcised. What's the thing in your life that's collecting dirt? What's the thing that you need to cut out of your life that's going to get you infected and is already infected in your life? It's not affecting somebody, it's infecting somebody. So God is saying, before we go any farther, before I give you what I always had for you, you got to cut yourself. And so many of us think recovery, um, see, at the end of the day, there was a first cut. The first cut is when you put the bottle down. The second cut is when you cut into yourself for the reason why you picked the bottle up. It's that secret stuff, it's that emotion, it's that mindset, it's that perspective. It's that behavior that you still got without the dope. It's the thing that God says, I can't take you any farther until this is cut. And after the circumstance system takes place, God says, I'm going to give time to heal. See, see, see that it shouldn't take a lifetime to heal from something that happened years ago. God will give you a time to heal before he sends you. God cut them. He, they cut themselves and then they had to heal. See, you're here to heal. But if you don't do the second cut, you're not going to stay sober. 
So you, you got to cut it. You got. I don't know what it is for you. I don't know what you had to cross over, but it wasn't over after you crossed over. You got to cut it, and you got to cut this out of your life right now. Otherwise, you can't go farther. You can't. It's a mindset. It's a perspective. It's you taking little drinks out of that little vodka bottle that you think only is served on the airplanes that you got in your sock right now. Whatever it may be. It could be, hey, I used to do tarot, but now I'm doing biking. It could be a cut. It's got to be a cut. Cut it out. Cut it out of your life. You got to cut before you, you're not going to see the promises. God, God, throughout the 40 years, he weeded people out, and now God's about ready to wean them. After the circumstance, God says, I'm going to roll the reproach of Egypt off you. Once God sees that you're willing to cut this out of your life, and I'm not talking about booze, drugs, alcohol, gambling, or sex. I'm talking about behavior or a mindset. I'm talking about your secret stuff. He's going to roll the reproach of Egypt off of you. That's a disgrace of anything you've ever done. When God rolled the reproach out of me, the feelings of a no good dad, drug addict, terrible son, terrible employee, 20 years addicted, he rolled those feelings right out of my life. If you never experienced those things rolled out of your life, you will get high again. And the reason why he won't roll them is because you won't cut it. And if you won't cut it, you won't cut it. So the rolling of the reproach of Egypt happens, and the next day, I think it was on the 14th day, now if a crack addict like me can have a memory like this, the Word of God is living and active, sharper than a double-edged sword. They had Passover to remind themselves of what God has already done. On that very time, they began to eat the food of the land. And they ate the food of the land and more or less how it went down like this. The minute that they did that, God began to say this, I am shutting off the manna. I'm not going to feed you from heaven like I used to feed you. Manna is mercy. You're a big boy now. You cut. You crossed. And I rolled away the feelings, the disgrace and the shame. This is a critical point in your journey of recovery. Because now what happens is this. It's like, oh my God, um, I got to learn how to encourage myself. Oh my God, I got to work the land that God has called me to work. Oh my God, I not only got to work, I got to eat from the land that I'm called to work. I'm no longer spoon fed. It's no longer a milk situation. It's a meat situation. I mean, if somebody dares to serve you spiritual meat, what I'm going to do in 2019, so many of us want to be served milk and and I'm not one of those tea babies anymore. I'm a grown man. So I got to be taken off the tea. I'm not going to go into it. Some of you caught it. (laughs) And I got to start chewing because you can serve me a spiritual steak, but I still got to chew it to digest it. So you gave it to me, but my mouth has got to chew it and swallow it. God gave it to me. I did the work to digest it. So now I go on to this. He cuts the manna off. He cuts it off. And and he says, you're going to have to be a big boy or a big girl now. Now they're ready for Jericho. So now they get to Jericho, and and Joshua says, hey, let's do this. So this is profound to me. Remember when they got the manna to begin with, with Moses, basically what God told Moses is this. He says, for the first six days, I want you to go collect enough just for that day. Why do you think they tell us it's a one day at a time program? Quit looking in the future. Quit looking in the past. Be present and enjoy your gift. Because at the end of the day, God was training them the whole time to not only obtain their promises, to keep and evolve from them. Too many of us have gotten stuff and lost it. God isn't going to give you the keys for the car until you're ready to drive. You can go steal them. We do that. But he checked this out. This is profound to me. So so he says to these guys, um, he tells Joshua, this is what I want you to do. For six days, I want you to take the ark, I want you to take the trumpets, and I want you to walk around the city six times, once a day. Now, now some of us are here right now in our recovery, okay? So this is how we're working. Can you imagine? Joshua didn't tell them why they were doing it, but by now they were a little more obedient. So, so I want to equate this, this, this time now that to, to your life today. So, so, so your sponsor tells you, hey, Hey, just walk around. Don't worry about why you're marching. Don't worry about why you have to be honest in small group. Don't worry about why you got to work the steps. Just work it. Just march. It happened for me. It's gonna, so, 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 so this is day one. I admitted I was powerless. We admitted we were powerless and our life had become unmanageable. I walk around Jericho once. Oh, 
that, what, what, what was that? That didn't do much. Came to believe that a power greater than myself could restore me to sanity. Step two, second day. I'm still insane. <laughs> Third day. Third day. Third day. Became willing to turn my will and my life over to the care of God as I understood them. Third march around Jericho. Nothing's happening. Fourth day. Be searching in fearless moral inventory of myself. Well, now you're making me work during the work before I just marched. I still ain't feeling like this is working. Fifth day. Admitted to God, myself, and another human being the exact natures of my wrong. I just did my fifth step. Fifth day walking around Jericho. The walls are still here. I still feel the same. Sixth day. Became entirely ready to have God remove my defects of character. Well, it still seems like I got them. I don't know, maybe I feel a little more powerful. I'm still crazy. How do I know if I turn my will and my life over to care of God as I am? Well, I worked the four steps, so that's a start. But now I'm on the sixth day, and you've told me to march sponsor for the last six days for these six steps, and I still feel the same. So I'm not going to march anymore. The walls are still there. I still feel like I've always felt, and this program doesn't work. But on the seventh day, if you're still around on the seventh day, we're going to teach you how to march. On the seventh day, they told them to walk seven times. So it's the seventh day. The walls are still up, but I'm going to do what my sponsor said. Humbly ask God to remove my shortcomings. Oh, walls are still there. Second walk on the seventh day. Became to, to make amends to everyone that I had harmed. Get and walk around on the seventh day for the second time. The walls are still there. Then I'm going to walk around the third. Made direct amends wherever possible except when do show would injure them or others. I did it now. This is my third time. On the seventh day, the walls are still there. I'm getting tired. I fail to recognize the whole time that I'm walking and marching, my endurance is growing and my faith is still in the game. Because my endurance has got to be where it needs to be. When I was wrong, I promptly admit it. Oh, wow. I can't see anything changing, but something's changing inside of me. So now I'm on the fifth time of the seventh day, I think. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> I don't even know why I'm doing it because nothing seems to be changing. But I don't want to go back to slavery. Amen. And God has already performed a Red Sea, the manna, the Jordan, Mount Sinai. Yeah, yeah. He's already done all these things. And I got all these scouts in here telling me that these promises are true. Did you hear that? What Pastor Jeff said about Kylie? I mean, he's initiated all these things. And what he said about Mike, did you hear Mike's sons and daughters talk about? It? Did you hear what they just said? So I sought through prayer and meditation to improve my conscious contact with God, praying only for the knowledge of his will and the power to carry it out. <coughs> the wall's still there. But on the seventh time of the seventh day, the seventh, having had a spiritual awakening as a result of the 12 other times I've walked around this God forsaking wall with nothing happening, as a result of these steps, I tried to carry the message and to practice these principles in all my affairs. I said, God, why do you want me to do this to these people? That's 12 times, 12 steps. But they walked around 13 times. God told me to tell you this and I'm done because I'm not even going to get to the rest of it. It's in working the 12 steps the 13th time they went around. It's the second time through on the 12 steps is where you're going to get your freedom. God bless you.